This video is published under the Creative Commons license BY and CSA, which means attribution, non-commercial and share-alike. Third-party material has been used, for which the permission is specified explicitly for every diagram, photograph or whatever has been used. Please mention the author as Andreas Pfennig, Products, Environment and Processes, Department of Chemical Engineering, Université de Liège, Belgium. A disclaimer applies. Welcome again to this lecture on thermal unit operations and in this lecture, on this part of the lecture series, we will start to discuss distillation and rectification that is applying the general principles to the specific process of distillation and rectification. And I will start out again with the introduction. If one wants to introduce into a new topic, one possibility is to start out historically. And if you look back at distillation where it started, well, the start actually is not known, but we have very early on documents that describe that distillation is a very old process. It has already been performed by the alchemists, for example, in Alexandria in the first and in the second century. And there you can see how distillation actually operates. You have, so to speak, a vessel in which you fill your liquid that you want to distill, so that's a multi-component mixture. You heat that up with, uh, with an oven, and that is a typical oven if you, even if you uh, visit uh, North African countries today, you sometimes see, see similar ovens for cooking. Yeah, they are operated, for example, by charcoal and are able to, of course, heat up the liquid in this vessel. The liquid is then partially evaporated. The vapor rises and up here the vapor is then condensed. The condensate is then running down this tube and will be collected in this second vessel. So distillation works by partial evaporation of a liquid. And that's exactly uh, shown or realized in this equipment. One weakness of this equipment is, if you look at the condenser here, that that is an air-driven, uh, air-operated condenser. So just the surrounding air supplies the cooling agent, or is the cooling agent, that is used for condensing. And that means, of course, that very volatile components will not be condensed, but will still keep a vapor, stay vapor and will then just, well, leave the equipment down here after they have run through this tube. So, if the cooling is not efficient enough, you are not able to distill, or to recover at least, uh, uh, very volatile components. And that was actually one of the major breakthroughs for development of distillation technology. And that was actually required for that process that really started distillation uh, progress, so to speak. And that was the distillation of alcohol. Because people realized uh, that the uh, alcohol could not only be used as a medicine, but also could be used as consumable. And that required, of course, big equipment because people drink a lot. And so equipment like this has been uh, designed, actually this is al almost 200 years old now, uh, by Eneas Coffey, who was one of the best engineers of his time. And you see a distillation column here that very much resembles what you find also today. Of course, uh, only further on in the lecture series, I will tell you how equipment looks like today. And once you have seen that, you may want to come back to this slide and have a look and you will realize that actually what I tell you is quite correct. You see that you have two parts. You have a rectifying and a stripping section, which you usually have in distillation or rectification on, for that matter. You have certain internals, so it's a more or less a vertical tube in which distillation is performed, where you have so-called plates. The plates have holes, so it's a sieve tray, as we call it today in distillation. There are certain elements that look like valves, so it's also a combination with a valve tray, something that also exists today. You see the so-called downcomers here. That is, well, how does it operate? I should explain that, of course. Well, first of all, you have your liquid containing uh, feed, uh, wine, uh, your alcohol containing feed, for example, wine that is heated by steam, it's direct heating, so heating steam is entered. Trans heat transfer is by direct contact, so then the vapor will be produced, which is of course enriched in alcohol. So the vapor will rise through these different sieve trays, sieve and valve trays. 
Up here it will then be transferred to the second part again, a little bit reheated so to speak, and then will continue up here to up here. Up here, of course, one has to take care of the CO2, which is usually contained in the wine due to the fermentation process. That CO2 can be removed up here. And the alcohol-enriched vapor is then condensated up here with um, the water cooling system. The condensate is then partially removed as distillate, and the remainder of the condensate is returned into the column so that you have inside the column a counter flow of the vapor and the liquid. And that's actually the effect of, that you want to have if you want to perform what is called rectification. But as I said previously already, uh, rectification will be, or the difference between distillation and uh, rectification will be dealt with later. The explanation will become clear when I have shown you the differences, so to speak. So we have to wait until then. So we have a countercurrent flow here, the vapor rising through these sieve trays in this direction, the liquid meandering through here, the, it's, the liquid is passing through the tray, then passing through the downcomer to the next lower tray, crossing the tray, going to the next downcomer, passing through the tray, and so on. So the liquid is meandering through the column. It is then being transferred to, the, to this first part of the distillation, and here it continues the same way, the arrows the dark arrows show the direction of the flow of the liquid. And then in the end it, it is returned to the bottom vessel where the entire thing is being heated. So also here distillation is realized by partial evaporation of the liquid. The vapor is being enriched in alcohol and this is of course a, a multi-effect process, so to speak, so you can assume that you have several equilibria in succession by this tricky combination of these countercurrent flow rates with the different internals here. And the internals are actually, uh, the, the function of these internals is to intensify the contact between the liquid and the vapor so as to enhance the mass transfer. Okay, so we see also here we have partial evaporation of the liquid, enrichment of the more volatile component in the vapor, and that way we are able to separate components with, with a different volatility. And the distillate will of course be strongly enriched in the alcohol, whereas in the mash, out, mash outlet down here we have more or less pure water with only a very minute fraction of alcohol remaining. As I said, this is a very typical equipment and very much looks like those pieces of equipment that you find today, even that you pa uh, place these two fractions side by side and not on top of each other, which is quite frequent today, but also sometimes you find this arrangement, if the tower would be coming too high, then you split it and operate it exactly the same way as it is done here, more or less. So this is a more or less very still modern looking equipment uh, 200 years ago. So we will be looking how the processes look like in more detail. And if you want to uh, do that, we will start out at first with looking at equipment which has only a single theoretical stage because that simplifies considerations, of course. So we will first have a look at single stage processes. And for these single stage processes, I should um, show you a major distinction of different variants that are still possible. One option is to run the single stage distillation in a batch mode. Batch means is that means that you have a certain defined quantity of feedstock that you treat in one batch, one so-called batch. So you have your reboiler, you fill in your starting material, a certain defined quantity, and then start out your process. So you evaporate that, you may stir if you like, if the viscosity is too high or some, if you have solids in there that you want to uh, keep floating, so you stir that. The, that liquid is then partially evaporated, the distillate is then condensed and you wind up with your condensate. What remains in the reboiler is called the residue. Now, of course, the distillate will be again enriched in the light boiling component, whereas the residue will be correspondingly enriched in the heavy boiling component. That way you are able to separate light boiling and heavy boiling components. 
Of course, if, if you want to set up balances later for this process, it means that we uh, have to uh, take the time-dependent properties into account. The amount of the residue will change with time. That means we have to set up time-dependent uh, balances. The other option is to run the uh, equipment or the distillation in a continuous mode. And that means that we have a continuous feed which, is a, which has a constant flow rate. We have a continuous energy um, supply with a heating, uh, some heating device. And by that, the feed is partially evaporated. That partially evaporated vapor, or by partial uh, evaporation produced vapor, is again enriched in light boiling component, which is then condensed and we wind up with a distillate. On the other hand side, we remove the bottom product or, for short, the bottoms. Now, of course, this shows you a little bit how different operation modes are possible. And here, of course, in this case, for the continuous process, if we want to set up the balances, we again make an assumption, a typical assumption, more or less, for all continuous the operated equipment. We set up balances and assuming that we have a steady state. Steady state meaning that at any point of the process, everything is constant. The properties are constant, densities, concentrations, viscosities, but also the flow rates at that point, at that regarded point, are constant. So if you look at this point, for example, the feed flow rate will be constant. Here the density will be constant, the concentration will be constant here as well. Here the flow rates are constant. Everything is time independent. And in that steady state, of course, you don't have to account for the accumulation term, so to speak, in your control volume. So if you set up then the balance for the entire equipment or for fractions of the equipment, if we have more complex equipment, then we assume that there is no accumulation of the regarded property within the control volume. Okay, having said that, having introduced historically and shown you how one can operate in principle in batch and in continuous mode, I should mention or explicitly uh, specify a little bit more in detail how important de uh, distillation actually is as a separation process. It has been estimated that in, alone in the, Uni uh, the United States th we have 40,000 distillation columns in operation. It is a very rough estimate determined at the side of a conference on a simple piece of paper and uh, it may be relatively inaccurate but nevertheless gives you an order of magnitude. So 40,000 in the US alone. On the other hand side it has been estimated that roughly 10% of the entire primary energy consumption of a developed country is used up in distillation. And that corresponds to 40% of the energy that is used in a chemical industry. Which means that a large fraction of the energy that is used by chemical industry is really used for distillation. Which in turn means uh, that optimizing distillation really gives you a chance of saving lots of money. You know, because it directly corresponds to energy savings. Okay, having said all that, I would like to summarize with again some take-home messages. On the one hand side, uh, I would like to again mention that distillation is performed by partial evaporation of the liquid, where the light boiling components are enriched in the vapor and the heavy boiling components in the liquid. And I have told you just a second ago that distillation is the most frequently encountered thermal separation process in chemical industry and really contributes significantly to the energy consumption of the corresponding industry. With that, thank you for today and hope to see you next time.